Mark here for Mark 2.0. Brian is my co-host, and we have the legend himself from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, Adventures in Babysitting, Toy Soldiers, tons of TV shows. Keith Coogan, welcome to the Mark 2.0 podcast. Oh. We're so thrilled. Woo! Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Great having you sure. here. Start out by talking, because you came from a Hollywood family. How, when did you first know that you wanted to get into the industry? I, I didn't know I that it was, it was an industry. Um, I just wanted to be on TV. I saw kids <laughs> nice. on Sesame Street, Electric Company. Uh, my mom was a real young mom, um, 15 and married and pregnant. And I came along right after her 16th birthday. So in a Catholic family, that wasn't really flying. So my mom didn't talk to my grandfather. I had no idea who Jackie Coogan was. I didn't know anything that there was a showbiz thing to be had. We were living in Sacramento. And uh, I'm just, I say the, I utter the words, I want to be on TV. And my mom explains, well, it's a career and you got to like start and get training and do commercials, then guest appearances, then movies of the week. And then maybe, and I'm like, ah, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> and lo and behold, about six months later, she said, I became very performative. I jumped into the middle of the living room and sang whatever commercial Oscar Mayer Wiener song or whatever. And I'm like, O-S-C-A-R. And I'm like, oh, gritty. Yeah, I hate it. It was like eating broken glass. But I said, I'm, I'm ready to do the work, whatever it takes, you know, to, 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 to be one of those kids that are on TV. That's all I understood. It was like, um, as I used to say, those kids look happy. Maybe if I'm on TV, I'll be happy too. <laughs> I believe that what was on TV was maybe more real. At least it was more exciting than, you know, the uh, practical shack that we were living in in Sacramento. They had like a Studebaker up on blocks and they'd shoot beer bottles off the top of it. Oh, it was, it was glorious. Anyway, wow. um, and it truly was like my family said a um you're going to start in commercials and then do guest appearances and that was kind of the career career trajectory hoping to move up to movies someday so you went right into commercials then i did i went right into wow. i had uh it was weird i had done uh non i know the oscar meyer song totally and i will never forget yeah. it yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I had gotten a non-union, just a stand-in job on a McDonald's commercial. And this was before I had an agent or was union. And um, uh, I did a day on it. And, uh, you know, they break the kid to go to school or to lunch or whatever. And uh, I come in for the lighting. And I'm, you know, standing at the counter and get the tray of food. And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, I'm acting it out. And uh, my family is like, you know, definitely use your eyes or a good weapon for, for an actor. And commercials are really quick. So, um they're like, oh, we, this kid's great. Let's use this kid. And you really can't, you know, the mom of the other kid was like, you hired my kid. You can't just switch, you know, change horses in the middle of the stream. And you can't, there's, there's like kind of contractual stuff involved in that. So, um, uh, the director said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to use you for something. And so in the meantime, my mom had pursued, she asked around, how do I get paid for this? And people were like, well, was it union? She's like, he wasn't, no. And she, they go, well, you're probably not going to get paid. You got to join the union. You got to, you know, get to the agent. And, you know, there's a whole process. So we did that. Um, and I could read really well. Uh, my mom did teach me how to read at three. So handed a page of copy by the uh, Don Schwartz. and Don Schwartz and Associates on Sunset Boulevard. And he had a lot of kid, kid agency. And, um, you know, do you need a minute? It was like a page of text. And I'm like, nope, got it. Ooh. And uh, could rattle it off. And they're just like, wow, let's get him out. So, but my mom didn't want me to use the Coogan name. It, he's my, he's her father. So she married and I was born under her married name. Mm. So Coogan isn't even my legal name. I, I use that as a stage name after my grandfather passed and helped transition from TV into, into doing movies. But once you start doing commercials, I did about a hundred national commercials from cool whip to charmin to kool-aid to uh you know com uh, toy commercials he-man sucker man um foxfire remote controlled cars uh el toro lawnmowers and the first jobs that i got were a series of mcdonald's for commercials for that director denny harris and i did a four with like ronald and mcdonald land and uh um 
that uh, is always good on your resume when you're going out for other commercials. Hey, you did McDonald's spots. And your dream is to do Levi's, Coca Cola, or McDonald's. I never did Levi's. Say, I never that's did Coca Cola. Yeah. Big uh, time back then. Wow. That's insane. And then you did like a hundred and some commercials. Wow. Yeah. Uh, my last one was 10 years after I joined the union. And, and the last one was in 86. It was for McDonald's. And it was a back to school spot with oh. the kids. Awkward first day, back to school. And then they all meet up at the end of McDonald's and uh, everything's okay again. <laughs> what was the biggest change from then and now for McDonald's commercials? Uh, that uh, nothing much. The food <laughs> is... Um, helped along it's really food it's really cooked in a mcdonald's kitchen they have a fake mcdonald's in like city of industry that they update to look like the mcdonald's around the country as they update their their look uh -huh. and uh they it has movable walls and a working kitchen right and so but you also you you can't mess with the chicken nuggets right uh, or like say I'm doing a KFC commercial and I did like the first buttermilk biscuit ad. And they're like, you can't um, manipulate, you know, it has to be baked in the same process as the McDonald's, you know, does for real in their kitchen. You can't bake it at home in a, your own pan and say that's, you know, what people are going to buy as consumers. There's a legal aspect, uh -huh. but you can make 200 of them and pick the best looking four to put on that family's plate. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of cooking a bunch of them and going and cherry picking and you call those heroes and so and also you know, work on commercials where I did a lot of breakfast cereal commercials mm. from diggum smacks and uh say rice crispy snap crackle pop uh, uh i went up for tony the tiger i never got to frosted flakes that was like the king kumachaka um and uh, I would work with animated characters and stuff in those and you learn some food tricks they use heavy cream for the milk it looks much better on camera <laughs> and the cereal kind of floats in it better. And you, uh, if there's toast and orange juice and stuff, you're sitting on your lights for hours at a time. So on the toast, instead of a pat of butter that looks all nice and melty, it'll melt instantly and run off the plate. You use cheddar cheese. So they slice a pat of cheese, use a blowtorch and they melt it. So it just looks a little bit like melted butter and that will sit in day under the lights all day looking exactly like that oh picture perfect i must have seen you countless times and not even know it growing up in the 70s i probably watched everything where these cereal commercials were just filtered right to me oh yeah pillsbury Doughboy, duncan hind spots um the buster brown shoes uh what was one of the Hey, Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid guy. Oh, uh, oh Ridley yeah. Spearman Cup. So that was one, I think, that kind of, I thought that was one of the biggest spots, I think, was those, you know, the song Ridley Spearman Cup really keeps. Oh, yeah. And they did a series of spots. One of them had little vignettes, the guy getting married, the guy working on the pipes, the, and a kid shining shoes. And I was the shoe shine kid. And uh, that was 15 minutes of work. The director put his boot up. Mm -hmm. And go, hey, I just trying to think a couple of shots. Yeah, flick the towel. Okay. All right, wrap. Let's move on. <laughs> and I and you and you you don't you get paid by how long the commercial runs because there are thirteen week cycles, so a quarter. So they if for in thirteen weeks they will play the hell out of that ad, and if after the thirteen weeks they have an option to pay more money and kind of pick it up and do another thirteen weeks. And it's the same thing with cable and HBO buys and stuff. That's why you see the same movies. In a month, you're like, God, how many play times are they going to play this dang movie? Yeah. Well, they have a window where they can kind of play it as many times as they want and not pay any more or less to the actors. Mm -hmm. It's a time window. And commercials are pretty timely. A special deal or a new product intro. Um, and they are really eventually, they are much better cash. If you can work solidly in commercials, you make more than in a movie or you make more than on you know, a guest appearance on TV, getting on a TV series that were, runs 22 episodes a year for 10 years. That's some good money. <laughs> wow. That is fascinating. And Where's the best all, market? Uh, where are they being filmed at? In LA, Chicago? Oh, for us, it was all LA. I, Great. you know, an LA kid. Um, there wasn't, at, yet in the 70s, 
and early 80s, there wasn't ancillary markets like Vancouver or Atlanta that looked attractive for financial reasons. Um, it was L.A. or New York. And they would certainly set movies in Chicago, but like Adventures of Babysitting, we did two months in Toronto and two weeks in Chicago. It looks like it's shot in Chicago, but it ain't shot in Chicago. Um, and I understand Pretty in Pink also was shot in L.A., parts of it. Mm. Um, so, and other the others, like some other of, of the John Hughes movies, they shot some of it there, some of it here. Uh, oh, right. Locations is interesting. Um, New Orleans gets a lot of work now, too. But so commercial production, and that's the backbone of the industry. That's what breaks strikes. That's what uh, find a safe way forward during the pandemic. The big shows and movies, they got all those insurances and schedules that already have lead times. And, and they're prepared. They're prepared. You've seen and heard stories of movies getting shut down because an actor gets in Tom Cruise hurts his foot or whatever. And they got to pause for a while and then come back. Well, when pandemic hit all the movie companies and TV, that was fine. Commercials need to made, be made daily. Dozens of spots are shot around town a day. You know, there are spots for, you know, um, restaurants and stuff around L.A. and stuff that air for a week because it's a special deal. And, and they just have to keep producing spots all year, the smaller businesses. Then you've also got the what we call national commercials, which are for your nationwide brands that you'll see. Um you know, prime time. You get more if it airs uh, between 8 and 11 o'clock in like one of the 10 major population cities. And uh, then you do in other circumstances. Gosh, you can just work yourself to death. I didn't know there was so much out there like that. Oh, yeah. And that's why uh, they wanted to move quickly and find a way to get back to work, whether it's a strike or it's a uh, pandemic, uh, because television is is fueled by it's called commercial television for a reason mm. it is uh you know it's when you watch say the goldbergs it's a half hour show no it's 22 minutes of network television and eight minutes of ads and i think for an hour show it's 42 minutes of programming and 18 minutes of ads um that is or maybe 48 and 12 yeah 48 minutes and 12 minutes of ads <laughs> and um the uh, I added a theory that commercials are the shortest form of entertainment and the purest capitalist part of our kind of consumer market products, merchandising. They even call it content now instead of art or film. Right. Um, the commercial 30 second, and you got those one minute spots, Super Bowl ads. Then you have half hour television sitcom shot in front of a studio audience, half hour non-live, so single camera shows, hour long dramas, procedurals, hospital cop shows, that kind of stuff, family dramas. Um, then and and you're seeing uh, then movies of the week, two hour specials. So they used to do a lot of like movies of the week, after school specials. They'd be like features, but a little shorter. Yeah, I remember those Jams real well. in there, and they got to edit movies whether they're if they're like in theaters, like an hour and a half movie, well, that's going to play as two hours on, on, you know, TV with commercials in there to make it up, to make it two hours. So there'll be a half hour commercials in there. But if say it's too long, if it's closer to two hours movie, but they want to fit it in a two hour spot, they got to make cuts and you'll see the TV edit will have whole scenes just absolutely removed so they can stick commercials in there. Gosh, you're so knowledgeable. You have obviously been, I mean, you know, you have it all broken down into a science almost. It's like, you know, but you were one of the few people, I think, very unique situation where you got to be where, like, there was that advertising-driven TV and you were in there right at the right time. And, like, I I have so much stuff that you were in. I mean, I don't even know where to start, you know, from, from Laverne and Shirley, uh, what, It Is Enough, Fantasy Island, Little House, Love Boat Chips, Mork and Mindy, Silver Spoons. I mean, it just goes on like this. And, uh, <laughs> and that's not even the movies, you know, I'm not even going to do that yet. But how did you work that into your life? I mean, you must have been really, really busy. Uh, yes, uh, you're doing a school. My mom kept me in public school mm -hmm. when I wasn't on set. I was on set a lot to pull off that, you know, a lot of work. And there's also pilots that didn't go to series, other stuff that went to series, maybe briefly. I had a great 
show uh, Sticking Together or Mackenzie's in Paradise Cove with Clue Gulliger, Sean Marshall. And um, I think that was like 76, 77. Um, that, uh, well, it's show business. It's entertainment industry. And if you're going to kind of set yourself up as this is a, not a one shot, maybe I'll do something and I'll become a star. You're like, this is what I want to do for my life. Once I did learn that my grandfather does this and he did it his whole life. Really? I'm like, yeah, he started on stage. It like as soon as he could walk, he's on when stage. When was that? If you don't mind saying, when was that, that that really did hit you? Oh, uh, 78. So in, I was about eight. Yeah. And they had a screening of the kid in LA and press and, you know, Leonard Malton was there. That's that's a big start of me. Reviewers are always like Siskel and Ebert and like Leonard Malton. I grew up with them. You know, as an actor, yeah, I hold him in oh, high regard. Yes. And um, we ran into Leonard Malton recently and uh, he's doing great. He's uh, full of so many great stories. And he goes, it's funny, um, uh, when the kid had debuted, you know, it had kind of gone late for the screening and Jackie s sat on Chaplin's lap and fell asleep during the screening of the kid when it originally came out. Mm -hmm. And when they did the new one, I sat on my grandfather's lap and fell asleep during the movie. So that was, it. I, uh, I do, I fall asleep during movies, but I did uh, see, you know, afterwards, great story. I see them fetting my grandfather and I'd heard trickles of stories of, you know, oh, he's a big star, all oh, the money, or the, uh, you know, the square got so full, they had to lift his car above the crowd, and at six or seven years old, I'm like, you're all full of it. Uh, <laughs> at one point, my parents were carnies, <laughs> basically, like, short-time con artists, oh. and uh, kind of hippies, you know, counterculture, anti-establishment, anti-authority, so I was definitely raised with, like, a way to, always look a way to break into a building, <laughs> and uh, look for the fire exit in case the police hey, come. It's just it these was like were different times. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, it was it, awesome. And, but it was still analog, so you could prank phone call and get away with it. And uh, there's no cameras. I'm so lucky that I did have my stardom, or uh, dur or especially it's tougher when you're an adolescent. It's already tough being a teenager, but to do that in front of the cameras, and you know have that kind of press and peer pressure and there's a community of other actors your age looking at you going what's your next movie what's your it's always it's, it's kind of weird it's weird enough and your original question was how did you do that on top of real life and um the you audition after school so between three and six o'clock you're in the car right after school and you know if you have an audition because you get out of school and if your mom's not there you, you get on the school bus you go home or you walk home um, I was like a mile and a half from school. If you walk out and your mom's there in the car, you know, holding up like new wardrobe, you're like, oh, we're running over to the valley and we got to be there in 25 minutes. And so your you'll mom do multiple. sounds great, by the way. Great. Oh, you know, crazy circumstances. Um, uh, cause they do ask the impossible. They're like, can you get to the valley? Then can you get over to Sheila Manning, this commercial agent over in like the West side of LA? And then go ahead and head to Burbank also for you have a call back at five o'clock. Oh, yeah. You're supposed to get to hit three locations in LA. Uh, Forget it. Yeah. You know, kids would live, you know, an hour outside of town too. It's expensive to live in LA. So they'll live in better communities where it's cheaper. But then you got to sit in the car and, you know, do your, your homework in the car, learn your lines in the car, um, change. That was a serious drama thing. Okay. Now put on a commercial shirt. So you're changing the car and changing here. We would, stopped by my great grandmother's house and dye my hair because we found out who was cast as the dad of the mom. And we're like, they're brunettes. Keith, you're a towhead. We're like, well, let's get some hair dye and make my hair dark for the damn audition. And any actor awesome. that didn't do that, um, didn't, doesn't want the job. Obviously that's when Sean Young, like was outside Tim Burton's house in a Catwoman outfit. Well, every other actress, obviously they didn't want the job because that's what it takes. It takes hopping. We hop, my mom and I hopped studio walls. Wow. We heard about the show yeah. and we're like, Oh, we know the casting is that afternoon. And we're like, they don't have really great security on that lot. I think it was KTV, <laughs> KTLA. Uh, oh like, yeah. Oh, I know like, that one. It was like stone masonry X things, which yeah. you great hand and footholds. You're like, oh, over my this in like 10 seconds. She taught me how to, you know, bail a cyclone fence, 13 foot cyclone fence when I was five. Wow. So we, uh, pop the studio fence, walk into casting. 
And I, you know, I'm already working it around town and um, know the casting director. I've seen them before, and they, they go, "Ah, oh, you don't. I'm not. I don't see you on the thing. Nope, we're here. Uh huh. Just sign in. Yeah, we'll wait. That's cool. Go over the wow. lines and go in. And I think we got to network on it. Didn't book it, but it's still. They just uh, gave us positive reinforcement. They just encouraged us. <laughs> oh, pure awesomeness. That was good. That was I'm not great. recommending anyone hops a studio fence. They have motion yeah. detectors, ground sensors, cameras, and arm guards. And that was then. Now it's no, yeah, it's, yeah. much yeah different nowadays. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So let's see. Um, you have any... Well, let's, I don't even know what to ask you about. I'm, I'm totally a fan of like something really old like Laverne and Shirley. Yeah. And uh, um, I can barely even remember Eight is Enough. Oh, Eight is Enough was great. I did two I Eight is Enough, different characters. One was a smaller like B or C storyline. I think it was called the Perfect Triangle or something. Little Triangle. And it was like a one of the sisters was having like a little triangle love affair. Eh. But the other episode I did was the kid who came to dinner and I had run away and uh, Nicholas was hiding me in their back work shed (laughs) and bringing me like Lucky Charms to eat in a, you know, uh, army mess kit. And that's all they had to like kind of sneak out to me. And um, and usually when you're a guest appearance on the A storyline, you get five or six scenes, the way the TV structured, like, um, you don't work every day. They'll come in. You'll do maybe two or three days work on it. There's plenty of other stuff. The B storylines with the cast known cast members that, um, you know, they're going to do without you. Um, on Laverne and Shirley, we, uh, they used to shoot and on happy days, Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy, they used to shoot the episodes in front of a live studio audience on the night that it would air. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing Monday table read and the rehearse and blocking and then, you know, Wednesday, put it on camera tech, rest for, and then Friday, shoot in front of an audience, which makes sense. Take a nice weekend off. Laverne and Shirley aired on Tuesday nights. So we shot our episode on a Tuesday night. Hmm. So you start Wednesday, you do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then you come back Monday. And then you, you do, uh, and usually you used to do two shows uh, a seven o'clock show where kids are allowed in the audience, and then like a nine o'clock show where no kids are allowed in the audience. And especially with um, David Landers and Michael McKeon, they wrote their own bits and it wasn't in the script and they didn't tell producers until it was live in front of an audience and being filmed. And that broke my mom out too, because they went to grab me. They go, okay, give us the kid. My mom goes, say what? Uh, They go, we got to go teach him the bit. Because, you know, in the script, it's just like, it's kind of missing pages. So, um and nobody knew. Only the three of us knew what bit we were going to do. That was weird. Um, so uh, since it was a Tuesday night, we uh, also, Cindy Williams was sick. She had a cold. They had, you know, there's rumors of like, they needed to count each other's lines and have 50-50 stuff. And that's, I mean, to an extent, you want the show to be balanced between Laverne and Shirley. So um, in this episode, Cindy Williams was playing uh Laverne, I mean, Shirley, but she's also playing the ex-wife of the guy, the pilot that Shirley's dating. And the episode was titled The Other Woman. And so the pilot comes by and he's like, got me, the kid, and he drops me off to be babysat with Laverne while they go out on a date. And the mom shows up and looks, it's Cindy Williams in a blonde wig. No. Playing, playing another character so to balance that out they had a lot of scenes with like me drinking milk and pepsi with laverne and i actually was it was a bad babysitting uh moment maybe that was the beginning of the babysitting trauma for me um (laughs) so they because cindy williams was sick and because uh oh and by the way so you'll do a seven o'clock dress rehearsal where you shoot the dress and this is all on film there's no videotape um it's not digital cameras. It's they're shooting it on Panavision film and they don't get to see it until tomorrow's dailies. You got to send that to a lab and get it developed. And so you're doing one or two takes of each scene and just keep going, keep going. Um, in this case, they, they go, we can't do the seven o'clock dress rehearsal because Cindy might blow her voice out. So we're not filming a backup seven o'clock dress. We're just going to do the show at nine for everybody once. 
Mm-hmm. So we did it live in front of the studio audience and did it once. We had to do a couple of pickups later. I think I was there 11, till 11 o'clock at night. Um, it That Tuesday happened to be the day they shot John Lennon. Oh, gee, goodness. So but that was all done seeing, in front of a live audience. Yeah. Thing. yeah. And, and like, so A is enough was done at that house, right? On, on location at that house thing. It was done on sound stages. Yeah, these were all stages. Few, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, they shot a few exteriors. And if there was like a scene that had to be out there, you really don't. You just used establishing you shot in spring. Oh, that looks nice so Nice blue real. skies. And you do a couple, park the car. Now don't park the car. Do a night shot. On the Waltons at the end, the Waltons house. Yeah, yeah. Little lights go out, good night. That's yeah. a model. Oh, my God. Because, yeah. and, and you could turn each light out and on and off because you can't. <laughs> Yeah. have a film crew uh, out in one night film every permutation you need mm-hmm. with a the model they just go hey we could just right. you know build a dollhouse i started to interrupt your story so, yeah, go on. no 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 it was it's a downer note sorry i really know <laughs> how to bring the room down so it's the day they shot john lennon and everyone's freaked out they're like do we continue taping they're like the network's like yeah you continue taping and they on and it was after they moved to la so by the way L- laverne and shirley's original set their basement set in milwaukee was yeah. the Odd Couple TV show set we used. Think about the layout. Odd Couple had the door that came out, went down a little oh, step, and then down, and yeah. it's the same set. Oh, and then oh, once oh. Laverne and Shirley mm. moved to L.A., that set was reused for two and a half men. It has oh, the entrance wow. on the left, the little okay. stairs that come down, and uh, the kitchen off to the right. So I'll be darned. And also, uh, the, I've learned this about the Adams Family set. I saw pictures of the original Adams Family, you know, it's a black and white show, but it, they were production photos, and the set was pink, bright freaking pink, like a sponge job. Oh. And you're like, and all of, everything oh, wow. is weirder colors than you think that they are. And they're like, didn't matter. It's a black and white show. And um, the winds out that they took the sets from 20th Century Fox right after they'd wrapped the unsinkable Molly Brown. In it, there's a parlor sequence. The set's about three times bigger. So they took pieces of the parlor set from Unsinkable Molly Brown and built the Adams Family Mansion set. So Eight is Enough is shot entirely on a studio. They hopped around. You'd be at one studio for a couple of years and then, yeah, it got sold to Lorimar. Oh, Viacom owns it now. Yeah. Oh, TV owners would, oh, different network. Great. Move. It's cheaper to shoot somewhere else. You're kicking us off for a bigger show. So I, you know, I'd ask, like I did a little house and I asked people, didn't we shoot at MGM Studios once or twice? And they're like, yeah, they even don't even remember. They're like, yeah, we did. There'd be certain sets they'd have that they have to go and just rent it out from the other studio. Studios work together. They don't lock. They go, you want no, you pay top dollar for the rental. Little House um, looks like it's all outside. Oh yeah, Little House was shot um, on the like Disney Ranch of oh, like yeah, Valencia. No, no, they have like, okay, yeah, cool. I know. They did went about. up and shot, you know, the opening credits and stuff. I think kind of there. And then a lot of all, shows look like they started stage. outside and they moved towards As a matter of fact, It's so expensive. And I saw this with my own two eyes and I saw both sets with my own two eyes, both MASH and Little House as the seasons went on. Yeah. And the ratings, you know, always kind of there's a diminishing returns. Well, budget's got to be cut too. They go, no more exteriors. What? So at oh, 20th, like, we open a stage sense. door and you look inside and it's the 4077. And the sign that says which way to go, and all because the last few seasons of Mash were shot inside of a soundstage, including yeah. Jeeps driving up and everything. Oh, yeah. That's um, exactly Legend, the whole movie Legend Mash. was shot on a sound. It's amazing what you wow. can do with the magic of movies. Um, yeah. And uh, so Little House was all soundstage. Walton's was a soundstage, and they had their own back lot. So the Walton House was actually a repurposed house from Mayberry RFD. Oh, okay. Which also, that wasn't the original lot for Mayberry. That started at RKO 40 Acre Backlot. When that show moved to Warner Brothers, they repurposed the house that's closest to the Mayberry house. Like the original and that Andy Griffith. wound up looking closest to the Shiler, Virginia house for mm. the Waltons they needed. Yeah. They added a little annex and some eaves over it. And that became that house. That burnt twice. Then they recreated it, recreated it, and then they gave up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, when I did Night Rider. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay, you're okay. perfect. When I did uh, Night Rider, we shot in Clock Tower Square or Mockingbird, um, uh, Mockingbird Square. 
at Universal. Yeah. And there's the clock tower and the little park and all of the, you know, and they'll dress all of the buildings around to be whatever. So the Night Rider episode, it was like a small town. And me and my sister, um, Ann Lockhart, uh, June Lockhart's daughter, uh, have a bait shop. And we're in this little set that's opposite uh, the clock tower. And it's next to like a fake gas station thing. It was Texaco. And um, it winds up being Texaco and Back to the Future. But also just... the set is the only interior exterior set in the clock tower thing. Mm -hmm. So all the other buildings are fake doors and you just see a flat. Oh, yeah. I've been over there before. But that working. set was the diner from Back to the Future. It was the wow, Cafe 50s. Okay, yeah. It was the Cafe 80s. And it was also the uh, diner in the Sting that Robert Shaw goes into place it on Lucky Dan. Mm. And uh, oh. I just love that certain locations just be used over and over and over and redress. It's tough outside of the studio gates because LA is quick to tear stuff down and redo it. And, sure, you know, yeah. Original locations, you go, eh. they like really changed so much of the house. It doesn't even look like, you know, the original movie house anymore. But movie lots can be frozen in time and you'll still see these. You're like, oh, like you can go to Warner Brothers and see the Batman steps from the Batman series. They look exactly the same they did in the Batman TV series years ago. Good point. Good point. So you also did like Mork and Mindy too, huh? I'm kind of yeah. a big uh, fan of that when I was a kid. Sure, I don't think I missed one of those. I did the last episode of Mork and Mindy. Oh, Gotta wow. run part three. No uh, we were huge fans my my family loved it we went to tapings you could go to you just go to tapings and be part of the studio audience so i think i was at the raquel welch where they go to work there's a, like one two-parter episode mid-run of the show yeah we went to another one and then i got on the show and while we're in the casting there um we we're trying to name mirth they go we don't have a name for this character and you could fill out what Mark and Mindy's kid's name would be and put it in a bowl on the Paramount lot. So somebody said Mark and Earth and put it together, Mirth. <laughs> um, so yeah, I got to work with Pam Dower and Robert Williams and uh, Jonathan Winters. Uh, absolutely insane Jonathan Winters. I would have loved to met him. That is one unique guy. What a funny guy. Yeah, I would have loved to meet him too. I met Colonel Kierkegaard. I met the star pitcher for the Yankees in 1932. Wow. I met an officious security guard on the lot. I never met Jonathan Winters. Mm -hmm. I met a variety of characters he would embody on or off set, and he would never drop character, and he would never be himself. And that, as a kid, you just want to play. And you, and my mom is even she knows who the hell Jonathan Winters is. I I can do and I don't. Um, I know who Robin Williams is. And my mom just can say he's bigger than Robin Williams. He's more important. He's like this is a legend. And so I remember he was doing this picture bit, and he's like just taking so much time with every little bit. He throw it and catch it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was funny and you do it a couple of times so i my mom's like pushes me go and this is off you know just behind the set literally behind the flats my mom goes go play with him or whatever so i'm like 12 or whatever and i go down and i pretend to be the catcher and he just absolutely ignores me and keeps doing the <laughs> just won't he won't give me the ball i was like okay there are some adults that will not give you the ball <laughs> Oh man, he never came and I went out of character. Yeah, never broke character, never wow. was just, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. that was um that was weird. Robin Williams seems like, you know, uh well, we've heard uh, other people say he was just like super, super nice all the time, eh? And uh that must have been a treat to work with him. Oh my god. Uh yes, and here's the thing. It was the last episode. Oh, yeah. They'd already wrecked their apartment set. So you didn't even have the Mork and Mindy set. It was all demolished because, you know, Exodor had caught up to them or something like that. And so it was like had been, it was, they were still filming on it, but it was like wrecked in the show. So you didn't even really get to enjoy the set. You got, it was like a hotel, a nice five star hotel set where like all this press, I was a kid reporter for my school paper trying to interview Mirth. Because he's my age. Um, <laughs> I love that concept. He's born old and is oh, a yeah. little uh, Benjamin Button there. 
<laughs> um, and uh, they, we were there two days, and I think they got where they weren't getting picked up. Mm, the mood yeah, went yeah. to. I know what you mean. This is our last lunch together. This is our last dress rehearsal together. This is our, and I'm catching this is like the it's the death. I never got to enjoy Grandpa. I can only go to his funeral. Mm. Um, so that was a little rough. They were still pros. Robin was still on, still absolutely doing something different every single take. You know that he is responsible for four cameras being used as sitcoms. Originally, as a three camera sitcom, you call them mm. three camera sitcoms. Yeah, Lucy established a big wide shot of the set and the camera covering this way and a camera covering this way were covered. Until Robin Williams and Mork and Mindy, he wouldn't. They didn't know where he was going to go next. He's going to crawl over the couch. He's going to run into the kitchen. So they took a fourth camera and told them, wow. you are just doing this with Robin. You follow Robin. Mm. And they realized the utility of having that extra camera there for insert shots and close-ups and stuff. They're like, all right, every show we produce from now on, we'll have four cameras. So Robin Williams is responsible for it going from three camera to four camera. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else did Gigi? Oh, uh, well, let's see. What about the Silver Spoons episode? Because Brian yeah. is a musician. That was such a great, you know, episode. I loved watching it. Yeah. Uh, I got to be in uh, the band Splat. Rick, although isn't in the band, the episode is called Rick Sings because the lead singer of the band that Rick is managing in his black silk jacket, um, those cheesy 80s, like members only jackets, uh, he gets laryngitis. And so Rick has to sing. And so it's me, Bobby, J uh, Billy Jacoby or Billy Jane now, Alfonso Rivera and uh, Rick Schroeder and uh, somebody on drums. I don't know. He didn't have any lights or many lights. And uh, we, it, uh, I have to say sitcom shot in front of a studio audience are my least favorite format to work on as a performer, as an actor, as a human being. It is this grind, this machine. You have to be right every time. Um, you mess up at table read, your replacement will be walking into the studio before you are standing up from that table. So you have to just be on and know, like, I'm not sure which way to go. So if we cast you with that choice, that you do that. And if we'll guide you, as we, but really you're just left alone in this grueling from table read to put it on its feet. The next day you start blocking on the sets or you don't even get the sets. It is a rehearsal stage with tape marking off the set you're like when do we get they only get the stage for two days so that'll be you know thursday friday we'll get that wednesday network comes in and sees it all on its feet and then you go home and in the old days you would wait and wednesday night you'd get brand new pages as they rewrote everything thursday you got to deal with all the changes plus you now check and camera blocking friday is get in rehearse do a run through bring a studio audience and let's shoot this damn thing um so it is uh, it's a weird combo. I like theater. I love live theater. I love performing. The, the, to be able to do there, keep your concentration for two hours and hold an audience there, it's very personal. But it's also not shot. And equity rules, you cannot film a theater performance. They had to go through great lengths to get Hamilton on Disney Plus mm -hmm. because SAG laws prevented it huh. and equity laws prevented it. SAG said, that's not a SAG production. Oh, equity man. said, you can't yes. film an equity production. So that was all worked with the unions. They said, look, there's a pandemic. We got nothing. Can we put something on? They're like, yeah, yeah, we'll work it out. <laughs> they just don't make a habit of it. Yeah. When you do a live for you know, TV, ABC does live, you know, whatever, that's different. That's covered under the Screen Actors or the after American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, which got swallowed by SAG. Mm -hmm. You know, theater, theater, films, film. So yeah, three camera sitcoms were the worst of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. You've got the nerves of the live audience, but then you've got the permanence of these cameras. So, you know, if you're going to suck in front of an intimate little audience like that, it's nice to have it not film. Um, film, you're out you're shooting a TV show. You could take a risk and have a great take. You could take a risk and fall on your face. They're budgeted for about two or three takes for each shot. So, you know, nail it the first time. Second time, then you just like, time out. That's it. You guys got it. Are you happy with that? Is that good enough for TV? Yeah, let's move on. Um, I was known as One Take Mitchell. Maybe not because I was the best actor and delivered a brilliant thing, 
but I nailed it. I come in and nail it. I think okay, you nailed it. It's on mic. He's we heard everything. His face got all the cues. Props are handled right. Um, you could also try another take, and it's not going to get better. Mm. Not going to get worse. This is what I prepared to do. Mm. You could direct me. Um, is fine too. I love that's nerve wracking. You prepared something, and structured something, and the director goes, "Do it like a pirate. <laughs> do it, you know, do it differently." I think my battery's going. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hold on. All right. How am I? How are we doing? Can you hear We're me? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yay. So yeah, episodic television is a grind. Uh, Chips was fascinating because it was two locations a day. In the morning, we're going to the 210 freeway and we're going to wreck five cars and flip one and set one on fire. Then we're going to take lunch. Oh, then we're going to move over here into the stage and shoot the CHP scenes. And you're just like, they're doing two huge thing, you know, moves a day. It, it, it was, there were those stunt and vehicle shows, Knight Rider, Riptide, uh, Dukes of Hazard. By the way, Dukes of Hazard shot on the same lot right next to Walton's. Oh, and oftentimes okay. you'd be like Ike and Cora's like gas station general yeah. store for the Waltons in 1939. And then all of a sudden the general Lee would come f- <laughs> ripping by with two Jeez. cop cars chasing. Yeah. That is cool. beautiful. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh my God. What, a, what about 21 Jump Street? That was in Vancouver, oh, right? Because you did yes. such a great job. Not that you didn't do a jo- great job in everything else, oh, but it was you. just so such an iconic episode. Shannon Doherty was your sister. Yes. And it was a Johnny Depp free episode. So Johnny Depp was shooting Crybaby. Oh, wow. And the writers go, okay, wheel of characters. Everybody else gets an episode. So this was a Loki episode or Ioki, an Ioki episode. In the font that they print on the scripts, they use either a lower case. It doesn't, it looks like Loki instead of Ioki. Anyway, that was a joke on set. <laughs> uh, I got to work with Deloise. I got to work with um, Dustin Yuen. I got to work with Holly Robinson Pete. Uh, just know Johnny Depp because he was off in uh, East Coast. Wow. Where were they shooting at? Maryland? Baltimore? Um, and so uh, it was a lot to do on the episode. I had visited a girlfriend in Phoenix or Scottsdale that was working on Not Quite Human 2. Mm-hmm. And she said, Robin Lively needs a ride back home. Can you give her a ride back to LA on your way? I'm like, sure. I do have that audition for Jump Street in the morning. And like, I'll just stay at um, Scott Grimes. His dad also has an audition. So you, he needs to get up at eight. So we'll, you stay there. And it's like, cause there's like this weird family of all the actors and kids or friends know each other and their parents try to figure it out. Um, like you think soccer's hard. Try having multiple kids in the show business and <laughs> you and you know, you got a call back. Oh my God, it's a nightmare. So okay. I drove all night back to LA, got two hours of sleep, crawled into the studio for the audition and just was so low energy. And I had to play this guy that had given up on life and was and I'm usually a real sparkly kind of, you know, yeah, I'm a ham, I'm a total mug. I do, I do too much. <laughs> I'm very performative. So I just was like, uh, uh, this, and I got it. I got it. And it was with Tucker Gates, who was the youngest network television director. 21 years old or something like that Whoa. he was younger than spielberg was on night gallery um and he went on tucker if you look him up he's directing tons of stuff and so he, we get it in on time we get it on budget it looks great and he even reenacted a bit of like the vietnam war and the beat i was like nice nice job um shannon dear friend already knew her from the la scene and so like sure, Sweet 16 yeah. um and uh Funny, I've worked with Sally Kirkland, Sean Young, and Shannon Doherty. All women that have reputation for being trouble on a set. From my experience, they're merely women that had an opinion mm. on a yeah. set. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Any guy actor goes, no, nah, we should do that. I should come over here and do that. Oh, okay, we'll try that. The uh, girl goes out there like, you know, get in your trailer. Go do your eyeliner. They are so, it's awful. That changed quick in me too, because now one wrong look move and it's like you are canceled buddy um which is good it needed to be 100 years in this business and there's only been four women that ever ran a movie studio uh there's only been a handful of women directors nominated or winning you know winning oscars uh women will win the trade crafts costume design set design 
Do you ever see them as cinematographers? Do you ever see them in special no, effects? Right. Rarely. So we're going to move past that. I no longer want to hear first woman director of a block or first, you know, the, I, it's just who's competent, who pulls it in, you know, from the f- filmmaker who brought you this, this, just like the guys have it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're getting so many cool new stories told, or at least from a different perspective. Like all these stories have been told. You notice how everyone has to reboot, remake, rewrite, and recast. And they're handing all these intellectual properties to the new batch, the people of color and minorities and women and LGBT. They need to be represented on screen. It's important for their spirit, their mental health, and it's important for the community. But um, uh, it is been a male white heteronormative industry think of how many movies in the 80s breakfast club ferris bueller's day off 16 candles pretty in pink some kind of one oh yeah weird science yeah but thank you let's even drill it down to the b-level movies porkies now we start to get some diversity in um Police Academy. <laughs> Great point. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good. Good on you, Police Academy. You should be a director. You know, you'd be great. You've been Thank all you. through the whole thing, and you know, you'd be just really a good step forward in the movie <laughs> industry. I think for directing. Uh, I what, always. What director has, has really done something good for you? Chris Columbus. Like personally, cast me as Brad in Adventures of Babysitting. Wow. That was yeah. huge. That's the biggest thing in, that's happened in my career in my life. Uh, that set me on a string of studio pictures. Uh, so yeah, Chris uh, Columbus, hands what, down. Also, was, he's the blend. Of, yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say, what was Toy Soldiers like? Because that's an oh. intense film, you know. Yeah, baby. That was every kid in town wanted to get on it. Everybody wanted on this movie. They're like, they're doing a Taps and a Dead Poets Society meets Die Hard kind of movie. Really? You just explained it really well. That's exactly what Toy Soldier's script is. I want on that. So everybody, everybody went up for this. And um, I'm like, well, I'm not cool. And I'm not built. I'm not like an action guy. Well, there's that asthmatic, wheezy guy called Snuffy. That's a good in. And most <laughs> actors don't want to make themselves look a fool especially actors that are 19 or 20 years old and hitting the club scene around LA. Nobody really wanted Snuffy. So I was able to kind of get in there and bag it quick. Me and Lou Gossett Jr. were the first ones cast. I made fast friends with Dan Petrie Jr., the director. His brother, Donald Petrie Jr., huge director. His father, Daniel Petrie Sr., uh, also huge in the industry. His father used to direct Dick Van Dyke shows. As a matter of fact, I think Petrie dick van dyke's last name on the show is named after oh yeah that their family Rob Petrie, that's right. yes thank you <laughs> so by the way after toy soldiers we wound up in a poker game with david kep mark berg dan petrie like david kep who wrote jurassic park and all the new stuff whatever he wrote toy soldiers mm. <laughs> they even come up and they go mr kep mr when they say it when they're looking for mouth Wash, they start name dropping all the assistant producers, associate producers. Very funny. Wow. So that Adventures of Babysitting, that was like your pivotal moment into the movies. And then Toy Soldiers was soon after that or right after that? No, that was, uh, let's say, almost call it first and last. Yeah. So 80, we started babysitting in 86. We started shooting in 87. We did like two weeks rehearsal at, at, at the end of December, which I have never had another two weeks rehearsal ever on a movie i think toy soldiers was five days of rehearsal um and uh toy soldiers was shot in 90 and released in 91 mm. and, and don't uh tell shot mom after that out of order with don't tell mom so we shot mm. don't tell mom first and then i shot toy soldiers but they released him in opposite order oh wow interesting <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, Don't Tell Mom, probably one of my favorite movies of the time. I was that kid in high school. I had shoulder-length hair. I had a leather jacket. I had torn jeans, a concert shirt. Nothing else was going to touch my skin, no. And uh, so I was basically your character. And, um, and of course, there's Christine Applegate, which was just a world sensation 
you know, married with children, just, I, I, I don't know if anything was more popular than that show right around that time when it came out about a year in, you know, it's almost like they designed that movie for her. I, you know, I, I think it was totally not tailor made, but she is, it's in her wheelhouse. She's exceptionally good at comedy. You have to be really quick to do comedy. I like her to Marilyn Monroe. Incredibly intelligent, incredibly beautiful and sexy, but also really, really sharp and quick and uh she has the you know she's been a kid actor for years before that uh, i had almost gotten a show with her called like I think it was called like into the night or it was a thing where the dad was a night detective so he'd like take care of the kids during the day and then and jonathan ward was the brother and i was like ah damn you jonathan ward <laughs> um and uh because i just love the christina, christina applegate before mary with children had a bleach blonde bob just a stark cut with the bangs uh -huh. and um uh so after the first season of married with children somebody had slipped a script to al bundy um and he gave it to christina uh -huh. that's how it that it because of married with children that's you know they went through married with children to basically get her <laughs> and then she she shot it during hiatus during the summer and then went right back onto the set for season two of Married with Children. So Married with Children like really is the show that built a network. Them, them and the Simpsons oh, yeah. and Cops. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she seems to be a lot Tracy like that Elman's character. Show. Very savvy and business-like, you know. Wow. That is it. Well, so what was it? Um, can you give us a story on the Don't Tell Mom set? Something, something memorable, something funny? Every damn day we worked on that movie. Um, the writer, Neil Landau's brother, was the inspiration for Kenny. He was you back in the day. <laughs> did you get Chuck Taylors, by the way, or did you rock the uh, boots or what? What was your footwear, Chuck Taylors? That, Converse? No, it was. It was Vans. high tops. It went from Converse into Nike high tops and into Vans. Exactly. <laughs> it, it did exactly all of that. Yes, it ended up Rip somewhere jeans. with Ridge uh, um, Fast Times, you know, Ridge Mount High, somewhere in that kind of surfer look is where it ended up. Do you even slightly like like rock? Um, then uh, that was a great time to get the hair bands and stuff. I eventually was turned on to like I was late to the game, so by it was like. Metallica, Nothing Else Matters, Guns N' Roses. It was right before, you know, grunge dropped. I finally got into, like, hair metal right before grunge hit. Um, and then I just jumped on the grunge bandwagon. But and music is such an important part of films. And yeah. I love that a lot of the, these films have soundtracks. Toy Soldiers is a soundtrack recorded by the Irish Philharmonic Orchestra. A very militarist, militaristic, bombast snare drum kind of marching music uh, and it makes the movie. Um, they went, I had a day where I walked out of the trailer on Toy Soldiers, and there is gunshots going off, the bell towers in flame, three helicopters, a helicopter, the other helicopter that, you know, is in the shot, and then a yeah. follow helicopter that's the camera helicopter. There's always an extra helicopter you don't see in the shot. For Don't Tell Mom, it was um, that, uh, well, it was a wig. Uh, and I told the it, getting the movie story a, a bit. The abbreviated version is I was up for the Brian the Clown Dog Boy, the Josh Charles role. Mm. And my family had a rule: you don't do two roles in a row, or you don't do, do roles that are too similar. You'll get typecast, and you'll only yeah. do those roles for the rest of your career. Want to spread it out, be different, be a chameleon, change, change, gain weight, lose weight, do an accent, wear a beard, get change your hair color, cut it, grow it, wear a wig. Mm. Um, mm. And they also said, you want to be warm for your entire life and your career. You never want to be hot because you could go cold. Yeah, that's a good point. Just be warm. Just right. Who's that guy? What's his name? That's the way I like it. Tom Cruise huh. can't go to the supermarket. I, I can go to the supermarket. <laughs> wow, good um, point. So don't tell mom would be uh, the, uh, oh, so the wig. I uh, did keep a wig and jeans and a like, skull vest. And a baseball awesome. cap because the wig was cheap. I went with the Sebastian Bach baseball cap, long hair look. 
it had sold the wig. And uh, after I read the scene for the Con Dog Boy, I asked okay, Marcy Leroff, I go, can I um, come back in a few minutes and show you something? She's like, sure, 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 sure. We're, they were changing over to see the Kennys right after. So I walk out through a room of these long-haired, heavy metal, Guns N' Roses stoner guys, a few of which were friends, and I knew. So I'm like, oh, my God. So I go to the car, and I change, and I come back in and uh, walk right through them again in character. Ah, 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 ah. Kick the door open and in with the producer and the director and the catch. I'm like, who's in charge here? Let's do this. Rock and roll. <laughs> and red, I blacked out. I do not I was so in character. I absolutely don't remember the audition or what I did. I finished and I'm like, done. I'm ready to get out of the room. And Marcy Leroff goes, okay, Keith, thanks. Go ahead and take the wig and the hat off. And I you know, take the thing off. And the director and producer, Steve Herrick and Brian Riley and Bobby Newmeyer go like this. They go, that's the kid that was just in for the other. They didn't know it was me because it was such a completely different character. So what I love well, is they executed, invested in that. Yes. I went to a wig maker in Burbank. It was like his last years. He's this professional wig maker. Get a picture of my grandfather on the wall because he made PR pieces for him in the 60s. And they made a $3,000 hand-laced wig, two of them. So they spent six grand just on the wigs for Kenny. At the end, when I cut my hair, that's just taking the wig off and silent it into it like a flat top. I totally wondered about that. I totally wondered about that. Like, well, I guess they only up. gave him, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Even massive. close up shots, it looks like the hair is growing out of my head. They shaved my hairline about an eighth of an inch. Mm. So it would be it would be where my hairline would be. Yeah. And uh wow. it, it was yeah, it was uh it was really short. I think I had just done a movie where I had shaved had like I think I'd done cheetah or something and had my hair mm. really short for that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so that yeah. was fun. But it was also I would get into drag every day. I would be first in the hair and makeup way before Christina. She needs ten minutes. Literally ten they go, uh Fuck you! You're sorry. I just <laughs> okay. no. You're good. You're beautiful. Uh, and yeah. Ryan, she's ready. Like, what do you do with this? Right? What do you do with that? So, but I needed the hair and the wig, and it's a laced wig, and um, mm -hmm. and then in like a half an hour later, Joanna Cassidy would come. And she has a wig throughout the movie, but hers kind of looks like it's easier. You just kind of pop it on, and you're good to go. Yeah. It's not trying to show her hairline. And then, uh, then Christina, and uh, then you throw the jeans and the shirts and the layers, and then the leather jacket. And it's summer ah. in Valencia, which is a desert, just oh, on yeah. Iron Canyon okay. Road. It's just like the heat of the summer in a house where you have to turn the air conditioning off when you're shooting because it makes too much sound. Yeah. Dialogue recording. So it's just sweat box in there. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So that was the only that was the only difficult thing was yeah. it was uh, definitely high. And also they shot in order and continuity and they let the kitchen go. They left food in there and just day after day they would add leftovers and bits from lunch and like flies would be buzzing around. Oh yeah. And by the end, just before we clean up the house, um, they took a really nice house and they made it look like crap and then made it look good again by the end of the movie and handed it back to the family mm. looking good. But that kitchen stunk. Oh. oh my goodness. That's funny. It was yeah. trashed. I noticed that. I'm like, oh my God, I got a kitchen. You can't get, you can't ever forget the kitchen. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there's this thing coming, uh, what is the Jay and Silent Bob reboot? I reboot? Just, yeah. Was out, uh, I think two years ago, uh, it was the third, there was Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, and this is a reboot with a younger, diverse, uh, uh cast. In the movie, they're saying how new movies have to have young, diverse casts, so they made it a young, diverse cast. Mm -hmm. And it really stars Jay and uh, Harley Quinn Smith, who turns a star performance as uh, Jay's daughter. So Kevin mm -hmm. Smith's daughter plays Jay's daughter, mm -hmm. and Jay, is he, he directed a movie called uh, Madness in the Method, about method acting and how far you'd go to like get yeah. into a role so he really he wants he doesn't want to be just in it he's like reading for the serious detective in his in his film and they go cut that was great jay um actually we had you reading for the best friend the funny kind of best friend and he's like no i thought this was for the detective they're like yeah his agent's like yeah they're never gonna see you as anything but the funny best friend so it was really nice they gave jay a lot to do in reboot and he he hits it and um Harley Quinn is is phenomenal. She's got a 
huge career. Secretly, she had just done Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Didn't tell us, but bring her yeah. neck. Same with um, Danielle. Danielle mm. Harris from Don't Tell Mom was also in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm. Wow. Here. I got I yeah. got to get on uh, Tarantino 10 or, ten, or what are they going to call it? QT, QTX. QT10. Mm. His 10th movie. The yeah. only, the last movie he will write and direct. He'll direct wow. other projects. He'll write other projects. He'll produce. Tarantino's going to do the last movie he writes and directs. I got to get on it. The wow. Tar- Quentin. Yeah. I'm going to say it over and over. So like the keywords, Quentin Tarantino, Quentin yeah. Tarantino. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino. you're on a mission. That's right. Cast my ass. I love it. He had a scene where they talk about the kid in um, Inglorious Bastards. He cast my uncle, Don Stroud, in Django Unchained. He know, and he just screened Adventures in Babysitting at the New Beverly here in LA. So oh, he wow. knows about he now. I just need him to know that I need to get on his next movie. Oh, we need to get this man. out to him. Yeah. Seriously, I would love to hear you come back from that with a story or two. We'd probably never get any filming done as we just start talking about Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Oh, one of the greatest movies of all time. Jaws. Keith, right? Jaws, Keith, Raiders, yeah. totally. Uh so so Star Wars is in there. Maybe Empire First. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some people put Back to the Future on the list. I don't. I think Blade Runner's on there. I go some classics like 2001 and Lawrence of Arabia, Greatest Show on Earth. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Close Encounters, good film. I, I did totally lean towards the Spielberg. I lean towards all the 70 odd tour Lucas, Coppola, Spielberg, oh, Milius. Yeah. I still have to watch Close Encounters every now and then. I bought it on YouTube just so I'd have it. You know, it's those old ones that really, I have to watch them every once in a while. Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, uh, gosh, there's there's so many good ones. Uh, So this Fan X-22 thing in Utah, can you, what what goes on at that? Is that like a comic? Yeah, it is Thursday, Friday, Saturday. it's a Mormon town, so they ain't doing. Oh, Sundays that's for right. No convention. Jeez, Come on, Dan Farley <laughs> yeah. Motor throws one of the biggest stack celebrities, which is kind of rough because there's only so much budget people have. Yeah, and you're sitting there, sitting on the money you need to get your autographs or a selfie with people, and you're like, "Oh, you got to make some Sophie's choices at that point." Um, so it's great guest lineup, and uh, I'll be in at a booth in amongst the merch. Uh, superheroes uh, in training. Yeah. It, yeah, I do better a walk by of like, oh, Chips, oh, Fox and the Hound, oh, don't tell them, oh, Keith, it's you. And I do better there than looking down a long line and going, David Tennant, Lou Ferrigno, Keith who? Oh, yeah, do, okay. So I, I like to kind of sneak attack them down, down on the floor oh, and then get out and, and, and uh, yeah. talk nerd movies. I usually wear some Star Wars gear, maybe my awesome. Gren- Gremlins vans. Oh, nice. Um, a gre- yeah. a vans with little Gremlins and a little uh, car and stuff. I, I'm a total film nerd. Yeah. And uh we've, we've done enough films to do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That time was just so great though, you know, that whole oh. Spielberg era. Yeah. Oh, so on Toy Soldiers, the s- second unit director was Mickey Moore. Hmm. Mickey Moore directed the truck chick sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's the second wow. unit, the stunt coordinator, oh, second unit director my, on yeah. uh, Raiders. He was telling John Wayne and Catherine Hepburn stories. Where are, are we shooting? Are we shh, 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 Mickey's telling a story. The whole crew would just sit there. No. Uh, you know. Oh. So so I, mean, I do feel because I worked in that analog time from 76 through to now. Yeah. My grandfather got to see film created. Like he went from vaudeville to film. He got to see it go from silent to talkies to color to TV. I got to see it go to digital filming capturing act that was the first time they changed anything about filming it to streamers to netflix and itunes and who knows what's gonna happen 10 20 years from now how we're gonna when you just said you bought it on youtube like that wouldn't have been my first choice to purchase something on usually i'd purchase it on amazon or whatever or just have netflix and you watch what you can watch it's been there that long i think it predates amazon video that's how long it's been there i think i put a code in for force awakens when i bought the blu-ray or dvd mm-hmm. and that has followed me on every apple device i just have oh, force cool. awakens with wow. me i love how it just carries yeah. like four gig 
file so it's super high def and, they, and as a matter of fact when they updated the thing they like updated the file i'm like that's how you do it yeah and then i did i get academy screeners and there's one year where they just gave you itunes codes so oh, i have the like ladybird year of uh everything yeah. that they made that year oh no maybe maybe brooklyn yeah mm. a very um i'm a member of the tv academy and screen actors guild and so i go i get courted by golden globe oscar and emmy films they want Good word of mouth. They want you to vote for the SAG Awards. SAG Awards covers it all. It covers film and TV, and it's only cast based. You don't vote on directors or cameramen or anything. You only vote on, but they want that SAG Cast Award, which then turns into a Golden Globe, which then turns into an Emmy. Mm. So um, they vet, they court you. They do a screening yeah. on a movie lot, and they bring out the cat and they drag them out in front mm. of you. They do a Q and A with them. And then they stick them in front of you at a cocktail party with booze and food, and they prod them with a the cattle prod and go vote for me. Vote. I mean, literally, this and the Amazon and Netflix and you know throwing all this money and promoting to try to get the uh, get those awards, which help they help people know about the show, more people watch, and they help those people get jobs after that show. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what is the difference between like Netflix and the old like Paramount and? You yeah. know, what is the big, is, is there a big difference? Or are Great they both on, just on the same level now? No, we've seen studios turn hands. Uh, Columbia was owned by Coca-Cola. Mm, Paramount yeah. was owned by an oil company, Gulf and Western. Um, then you've seen mergers. All of a sudden, New Line swallowed by Warner Brothers, which is eaten by Discovery. That means that Bob Shea works for the Discovery Channel now. I don't understand how that works. Um, you've got um, you've got some shrinking. You've got some kind of conglomeration going on. So the day that Disney bought 20th Century Fox, a writer friend of mine, he goes, ah, that's, that sucks. I go, what? He goes, well, yesterday there were six studios for me to pitch my stuff to. Tomorrow there's going to be five studios oh, to pitch yeah. to because 20th is Disney. That's right. It's just a nice film brand to release their R-rated stuff on. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's just gonna, and it's not 20th Century Fox anymore. We downloaded, um, oh, God, good movie. What did we just pay for? Oh, the where the um, crawdads sing. Mm. Where the crawdads sing. Solid movie recommended. All right. Mm. But that um, uh, was, uh, I, wait, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, that was a Columbia picture. Anyway, the, so because, of the like ownership things um th there's no studio system anymore uh there are oh so the networks the, like different things now we have amazon and apple plus and google i'm not google youtube um what's behind each of these studios so you got um sony sony makes its money making microtransistors and selling insurance in the overseas market their gross revenue from sony pictures entertainment is three percent wow so whether Sony, which is the fastest to 30 shows in network television, Sony pumps out faith-based action, sci-fi, Brad Pitt movies. They got Jennifer Aniston working on it. You know what I mean? Like, they're really progressive. And we get to, they released um, The Star, which was Animals in the Manger going for the G a kid's movie. It's an animated movie. We got, How dare you do a Bible movie? I'm like, relax. It's, a, it's not a good story. The Bible is not. If you're a fan of Dan Harmon and Rick and Morty, you know the Bible is the ultimate story killer. Um, that uh, the, oh, so uh, Sony's fine. Um, Amazon. Amazon, uh, you know, pictures and Amazon originals and stuff. They, they have this side business that mails things to people. I hear it's doing well. <laughs> Apple Plus, limited amount. It's a nice, modest price for Apple Plus. A couple of really niche, A-list talent. Big five-star people. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. They make, like, computers, and I think they have, like, a billion devices in the hands of people around the world. Exactly. Apple's Give doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. Netflix oh, wow. is $14.5 billion in debt. Oh, they are they? That. Okay. Netflix is $14.5 billion in debt. Wow. They do wrong. One quarter, just the first quarter, the interest was two hundred and eighty seven million that aggregates to no, it was two hundred and thirty seven. It aggregated to eight hundred and ninety million dollars a year in interest on the debt. So not only do they have to rack back to pay off the debt, 
They've got a speed. Now they got Guido in the alley going, yeah, pay us the VIG. Now they got really serious money on the market, a million dollars, a billion dollars of interest a year. Wow. It's getting out of control. They're spending way too much money on content. This is why they've started cracking down on password sharing. They have an AI watching. They go, now we understand you travel and you sign in an Airbnb or your cousin's house. Yeah. That's fine. We don't want to see a simultaneous sign in in New York and LA. Oh, yeah. You're sharing okay, your password. We're going to send a message. Hey, for $1.99 extra, we'll just go ahead and give them a password and make it. It's, a, it's a called a group. Sam, it's called Save Your Ass Account because they know that they're doing it. Um, they make it too locked down to your IP or your home. It's, it's inconvenient. Now I can't just log in wherever I go and it's a pain in the ass. As soon as it's a pain in the ass, people get rid of it. Um, the, uh, uh, you remember, there's still a market for airplanes, hotels. Oh, yeah. There's still. You know, hotel ordering a movie. There's still, but it used to go features and then like hotels and airplanes. And then it would be on HBO. Then it would be on video, you know, and it would kind of die on video. Now it, you know, you don't know what, where it could go. I have a joke, you know, a friend of mine worked really hard on a movie. It was a passion project and it came together really well. They don't know what happened. It went straight to theaters. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know netflix has nothing to back it up like amazon and apple does i mean all they're trying to sell is content i guess they're in real trouble i, I don't know if you could dig your way out of that yeah, not with that's scary I, maybe i shouldn't be telling that story too many times mm. we could go pick on the other studios too but disney's yeah. fine they have um let's see two parks in la four parks in orlando cruise line in orlando five or six other parks around the world mm. Uh, and a library of films that will be watched generation after generation after generation. When they did Disney Plus and they said, hey, for seven bucks a month, you can have every animated movie we've ever made. I was like, well, that's a no brainer if you have kids. Just <laughs> loop, sure. you know, yeah. frozen. And you're oh, like, yeah. You're like, I just got a babysitter for six dollars a month. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. and they're jacking the price up a little bit. And, you know, mm -hmm. they have to. The economics don't work out. And also, guess what? Uh, let's think of this concept, Paramount Plus. There's a $5 a month and then there's a $10 a month ad free. Hey, that's great. Oh, I yeah. love ad free. Well, ads are nice because as I understand public uh, television is all based on ads. All that money, commercials. Remember this thing about products that want to get bought so they air commercials or get their stuff on TV? Man, it took me five years before I even noticed the 32 ounce Coca-Cola's on the American Idol judges' desks. Yeah. It went right past my subconscious. I go, oh, it's leftover from lunch. Wow. That's product placement, baby. Yeah. People are skipping in TiVo and commercials. Mm -hmm. They got to get the car driven by that family. You watch a show like Modern for every car's a Ford. Like every, you go, oh, every I didn't car. Even think about that. Car. Yeah. Wow. Um, no smoking in movies anymore unless it's the antagonist. The bad guy can smoke, mm -hmm. but you can't show him inhaling and you can't do There's still these rules. Um, wow. So, oh, so on the five dollar tier, that's great because advertisers, you know, they get their cut. It's kind of like the old model. Commercials are subsidizing your viewing of this, and also TV now has come up to feature level with the quality of scripts, entertainers, and showrunners, and um, cameramen. Uh, that ten dollar tier. Did you just screw over Procter and Gamble and Chevrolet? <laughs> did you just screw over Nabisco oh, Food wow. Corp? Because yeah. you just cut the advertiser out of the holy trinity. You now want mm, yeah. the viewers to just pay you directly. Uh, that's a lot of money on the table. And they're going to have to find a way to get you those ads. I don't want to see more billboards on the street. I don't no. need 20 minutes of trailers before a damn movie. That's getting egregious on the trailers, by the way, in theater trailers. So um, it, a balance will come. The force mm. will, you know, market forces. If, they, if it's truly a free market system, um, if it's not rigged, that debt call is going to come to Netflix one day. No. Other things are going to balance. They're no longer going to do $200 million deals to some showrunner. Uh, they're going to contract the, by the way, all the deals are not exclusive. The showrunner is God right now. Instead of a director or producer medium, or it's a studio medium, you know, every decade is kind of different. Now it's the showrunner medium. Can you hire someone that can deliver? not only the police procedural, but that fantasy show, we're also doing something over here on cable and we're trying something out here. And in five years, can you give me all this stuff and make it great and win awards? Yes. Give me a hundred million dollars and I will make that happen for you. Wow. And they need them so badly that they're getting non-exclusives. 
Mm. They can then also take a contract at another place and another place. Yeah. That'll all shift. That'll all change. Wow. That so didn't you ask me, is there truly any movie stars anymore? Or you no? know, I... <laughs> <laughs> was that another wow. interview? Sorry. Maybe it was no, another okay. one. Okay. Yeah, that is a good question. I'm like, oh, there's movie stars. Trust Here, me. Here's a really good question because I watched uh, Downhill Willie the other night. Uh, you should talk about that movie. But thank uh, you. Do you get residuals off of it? If it's streaming on something that's free, do you get Absolutely, still get residuals? Of course. Great. It was a Canadian buyout. So I didn't for five years. Okay. The deal was they can air it on C- Canadian Broadcasting System. They can DVD it up there. They can do whatever they want. But international is a different deal, but it's not going to play in the States for five years. And I was like, great. They paid me good money for three, for 16 days of principal photography, 60 days of second unit to do all the ski sequences. That's the fastest movie I'd ever worked on. Mm -hmm. I'd done 18 day shoots. You really need 18 days to make a quality picture, but 16 days for downhill Willie. What a cast though. Uh, Hawk from American gladiator, Estelle Getty, um, uh, uh, or no, Estelle Harris, uh, uh, Fred Stoller, uh, really cool, Stacy Keenan, yeah, Lachlan Monroe. Stacey, yeah. Uh, what wow. a cast! Was that stunts doing the downhill, or was that you doing all the downhill skiing? So, here's what I did for skiing I walked <laughs> up, I put my boots in the ski, cut to the stunt double. I <laughs> nice. didn't, I even encouraged the staff, cast. <laughs> at least you're like, first night, it. right before shooting, we're having like our drinks and. And getting to know each other. And and they're all like, can't wait to ski Black Comb or Whistler or these like, you know, four Black Diamond runs or whatever. And I go, um, you are not getting on a snowboard or skiing until we wrap this picture. Uh, you go ski whatever you want come, you know, that day. Oh, because they don't want to be held liable. Break your ankle or yeah. break your face and we delay. We got to recast you. I will kill every single one of you at the table. <laughs> and I, so I really, I, mean, they, I couldn't, I'm not the dad. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't ski. I didn't get close to it. The snowboarding, I did a little bit of that little snow. That is more dangerous. Okay. Just being in a right. snowboard going like 10 feet, way yeah. more dangerous. But we did get caught out. Um, so um, David Mitchell, who directed Downhill Willie, he directed like Ski School 2, uh, maybe um, uh, he directed a couple of other uh, ski kind of pictures. And um, he, uh, they, they, kind of run and gun with a handheld camera and skis and you to go to set you get on a ski lift and you go up to set and they run under canadian rules so there's no meals so you're working 10 hours with no meals i kind of passed out one day i'm like dude where's lunch and they're like oh no canadian rules i'm like uh canadian american meals. biology i need i need some some warm <laughs> yeah. a soup can i get some soup and every day they're like we need to get some food for keith it's americans um so we were one day there is a deadline for we have to finish shooting because the last piece of equipment has to be on the last ski run down so we're kind of we're like we're tight we got one more we can do this insta shot over here just a few of us we'll start sending the gear down they send all the gear down and we're shooting and and the ski lifts stop and we're at the top of the mountain cool we got our skis so us and the cameraman and what equipment we had we grabbed it and we just skied all the way down the mountain they radioed in and they had a flatbed truck come to pick us up mm-hmm. as high as they could get to and uh the director though skied down every day and i, I was like that's an insurance issue that you do <laughs> that's not a good like, point you know, he's a, such a skier don't even <laughs> oh worry. wow but shout out to the stunt people shout out to the uh, mccrackens the band in our bar scene Oh um, yeah, good job, guys! That was a great and scene. um, and Stacy Keenan, you were a trooper. Thanks for coming, doing that silly. And she's not in the industry anymore. I uh, don't know why not. She's so talented. She's so great. I think she's Natural like a district editor. attorney for LA or something like that. For uh, yeah, no, uh, that was a, <laughs> you. Come I, on, I, never. There was almost one moment where I wanted to drop the whole bit and just look at her and go like, you know, it's really been nice getting to know you, but and just drop the like down here yeah. really bit, but. <laughs> Wow. They were dropped. <laughs> yeah, but they, we had shot this one bit where the French guy, uh, Coco Le Beau, he um, the whole movie he's like, oh, the birds. I want to, you know, I want to get with the women. And then he's sitting at the bar with the like Texas guy, and he goes, "Yeah, no, I'm really British. I just use the French accent to shag more birds." I think they put that in the movie. That was a total improv, oh, and wow. it changes the way you look at that character the whole movie. No, but it's one of those like, oh, by the way, the writer went on to run Lionsgate. 
Wow. <laughs> Who would have thought? Right? Oh, wow. Hey, look, I worked mm. for PM Entertainment. They did these like karate movies and like little thrillers or ghost stories. And really the same mansion in every movie, the same red convertible Cadillac because it's a producer's car. They had a lot of stuff with Stephen first and uh, Ted Jan Roberts, who was their little action, like a kid that could do really good karate. So we're working on a movie of theirs. And um, the PA, Billy Applegate, I'll never forget his name because it sounded like Christine Applegate. So I, and he's really a hustler. I'm like, he's really like, we, they don't have a lot of crew. So he's just doing so much. And I wound up working for the McGann or something. And he's already high up. Wound up that they, while working on that, he wrote a script while he was a PA. And the distance from the lowest to the highest of the smaller production companies is only about 20 feet over there. It's not a boardroom <laughs> yeah. and a you know, secretary you got to get past. So winds up that they loved it. and they sh So he wrote the next movie they did. He was writer on it. Mm. The very next movie he directed. He went from a PA to a writer to directing in three pictures. Wow. That's unheard of. Yep. Yeah. Oh, when you're good, you're good. You yeah. Get good. yeah, get the job done. Uh, I did a new, new new world picture, which is Roger Corman's production company, also known for doing pretty quick pictures. My my surf movie. I did a ski movie, a surf movie, a ninja movie. Oh, I saw the surf movie. movie. Yeah, yeah. Under the boardwalk, great, amazing. They brought in a ringer, uh, Fritz Kirsch. He had done Children of the Corn in four weeks, including effects. So they said, "Can you pull this little surf movie in in uh, three weeks?" And uh, it was the only surf movie to be shot entirely in Southern California, including the surf. We never went north of some point. There was some point or whatever, and north and south. They're like, we never went north of here or south of here. It was all shot in this region. And they also did an on the water. It was a jet ski cam, so you could do lateral movement. Usually you're in the water kind of tracking somebody. So this is the first time surf scenes, you're traveling with the surfer with them. It was really cool. The surf sequences are great. It's a trashy Romeo and Juliet West Side Story remake with valleys and locals. And I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Under the Boardwalk so hard. That's, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so um, are you working on anything right now that's... Uh... Always auditioning. Um, yeah, don't ever stop, you, man. My, my goal had always been like, I want to do like two movies a year. Well, lo and behold, I, I, you know, and I do TV too. So, you know, two projects a year, you don't make a living off of it, but it keeps me alive kind of spiritually. I need to be on set. I need to be with my people. Um, so I, you know, I've always worked hard to me. It's hard to get an agent. It's hard to get an agent. So don't ever quit that. Uh, I have a great agent at Aqua Talent, uh, Courtney Pelton, who strangely played the Maya Bruton role in the television series pilot for Adventures in Babysitting. So she was a kid actor. So my agent was a kid actor and knows what I'm going through. We don't even have to talk about it. Like, got it, Keith. Um, and gets me up on just great stuff. Uh, and I bagged some stuff here and there. I was just on The Rookie on ABC. Um, uh, did uh, Actually, during pandemic, I did three TV shows and two movies. Granted, I could give you 25 bucks and you couldn't find these movies, but they're done and they'll <laughs> be distributed somewhere. One of them, they're yeah. like the whole cast of crew screening, and they're like, When are you releasing? What's the distribution? He's like, We're working on distribution. It's always the case. Oh, yeah. Well, one is Team of Two. It is a buddy cop movie, but one of the cops can't keep a partner. So he goes through 19 partners. Uh, I am one of the partners. Uh, and uh, uh, wrong reasons. What if. A crazy psycho fan kidnapped like a Britney Spears to get her in recovery. I actually, just kidnapped her to feed her some soup. Uh, <laughs> kind of an outrageous fortune thingy, and like get her cleaned up, and then you know let her get back out there and have a life. He'll probably get like death by police, but it's okay. He's got his own depressive <laughs> issues. So I play a um, what is it when you just don't care about society? Psychopathic or sociopath? I play a sociopathic <laughs> newscaster. Think um, <laughs> CNN. Uh, who's the one that uh, is Vanderbilt and his uh, Anderson Cooper? Think like Anderson Cooper, <laughs> but caring less about the dignity and humanity of the people you're interviewing. Yeah, and I have some great bits with Keckner, uh, David Keckner, who's you know not only he's a great comedian, but he's really good at drama and he's he scared me there a little bit i probably <laughs> messed with him a little bit on camera we had, we're rolling two cameras uh, it's digital so now you can actually shoot both ends at the same time and keckner's improvis improvisatorial god that's not a word 
you're going to get some improv when you work with David Koechner. <laughs> <laughs> so they go, let's shoot Keith's side at the same time we're shooting so we can go back and forth and we don't have to go, what did we say during that take? <laughs> um, and so Wrong Reasons, that was directed by Josh Rauch, who shot Magnum Dopus, which was the making of Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Oh, so it was on okay. Net, you know, Amazon Prime and you could watch this great documentary. And it's not one of those like behind the scenes documentary where it's a press package, EPK, where it's all night. Here's the, here's the costume. Here's the thing. No, this was a warts and all honest look at making an $8 million movie in New Orleans um, while three other movies are shooting around you. And like, you know, it's hard to find crew. They want to go work on Arrow. Um, uh, it was I got uh, into the Kevin Smith kind of view universe and uh, had a great you know like I'm in there now and that's weirdly tied to Marvel and then in reboot there's a bit with Chris Hemsworth who was Thor and we've got Adventures of Babysitting we have Thor but that was Vincent D'Onofrio who's another Marvel character but then we have Chris Hemsworth saying the dishes are done man which loops back to me to you've got to see Jay and Silent Bob reboot Kevin yeah. Smith just does me a big solid and like totally he, he goes he goes you know before I made movies I watched a lot of movies so he watched Don't Tell Mom probably right after he started working at Quick Stop oh so, wow and he what saw a, a stoner burnout guy who got into something cooking and turned his life around and you know did something I've actually had a lot of fans uh, and van letters and messages online and um, at conventions that said they were a layabout, you know, and it saw it, don't tell mom and got took cooking classes, went to culinary academy, and then now they're a gourmet chef at a five star restaurant wow. in Miami and totally taking care of their family. And this isn't a mm -hmm. one off. This was over and over, almost the same story. And I go, dude, I've worked on Emmy award winning, like after school specials about drunk driving and, and you know, yeah. McCarthyism, important <laughs> things. Oh, yeah. And the movie that changes the most people's lives is Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's wow. Dead. <laughs> the character is just lovable, you know? <laughs> it's, it's just it's such a great job. You, you just want the kid to, to succeed, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, all of you. them, you know, that whole crew, you know, just did a fabulous job in that movie. And it's just, oh, my goodness, it's just mayhem. And, so um, another thing we produced right after the pandemic broke, um, there is a real secret society for child actors. We yeah. meet at other child actors' homes, and we so you'll be over. Oh, are you at, talking about uh, the quarantine bunch? You got it. Oh yeah. And um, I'm a fan of anti comedy. I like Andy Kaufman. I like people that kind of mess with the audience. I'm loving uh, Nathan uh, for you and uh, the re rehearsal, brilliant stuff. Um, Synecdoche. I love those kind of like let's reframe it and look at it a little differently. And um, the quarantine bunch looks like an innocent little cute show trying to knock off Brady Bunch and child stars. It takes a weird turn. Uh, our uh, Zoom meetings, our support meetings, get crashed by a stalker fan, and then eventually starts dating Jeremy Miller, and then he disappears, and then they take over the show and the sixth episode is just a clip show about them wow. by a fireplace talking wow. about how they crashed and took over the child actor show. It's the most, it'll go. And you, if you like weird shit, it, like too many cooks, remember that? Um, oh yeah. We had Blue Karski on. Yeah. Thank you. We know him. Yeah. Well. We know Thank him you. well. So We're, he's coming. If you again. like too <laughs> many cooks, Give the quarantine bunch a shot. They're short, five, six. Is minutes. that on YouTube? There's, I've yeah, seen YouTube. I've seen one of them on YouTube. We also I built a website which has a universe. Okay. We made up a fake um child star for Dean um Tori Spelling's ex. Uh oh, I know. We call him Dino. About. Um yeah. he, he technically started acting when he was 19, but we made him a Scottish child star. Mm. So he's it's called this thing. And we've got um, a recipe on the website for feisty cock. Yeah. You want to, I can <laughs> teach you how to make my feisty cock. Um, and it's an actual recipe. Don't even, and there's weird, it's like a, yeah, you're going to crawl down a slight little rabbit hole because Jeff McIntyre, who went to junior high with, who we used to shoot stuff and, and shorts as a kid, 
we reunited at my 50th birthday party. So let's do something together. And we've got, and my 50th birthday party were all these child stars. It was this weird eighties party that I had like, you know, Willis crash it. Um, you know, from facts of life, I uh, mean, from uh, different, uh, strokes. different strokes. Yeah. I know yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, are those glow girls over there? Original gorgeous lady of wrestling. So, yeah. What the hell is happening? Oh, I had this yeah. weird, weird okay. party. There's, is that, Bewitched is that Tabitha from Bewitched? Is that that's Scotty <laughs> Schwartz? Yeah, it's, oh, there's wow. Scotty Schwartz. He always shows up. Oh. Corey Feldman was there. It was a fun party. We had a good good time. Um, so we had this idea. Let's work on something. Let's do something. And it was we were throwing the party at this friend of mine who's a writer, Ryan Paul James. So the three of us put our heads together and came up with the concept and produced it quick. We were the first thing to have the Zoom format for storytelling. Now, that week, we're about to shoot. Like, we've got everyone organized. We've gone SAG, so everyone's signing their thing. Everyone knows where they're getting paid. We're going to shoot it live, no stopping, and use everyone at home as a second camera, a little higher def. They're going to send those files in. We're going to put it together. We're going to make it look like it was a Zoom meeting, um, but it's going to be a little better quality. Uh, all of a sudden, the visual language on TV changes. Saturday Night Live is doing at-home taping. Everything is that Zoom format. Hamilton's behind the scenes and cast interviews were the Zoom format. It didn't hold viewers' interests. Mm -hmm. So quickly, they said, Saturday Night Live got mailed packages. Here's cameras, here's green screens, here's lights, here's ring lights, here's mics. And all of a sudden, that next time that Saturday Night Live did an episode, it kind of went off of that Zoom meeting look. And two weeks gone and no TV was doing it. They were figuring out a way. I had a, a ABC broadcaster does the entertainment george george pinocchio here and he was producing pieces from home that was trying to look like you know network stuff this is this is abc this is like a real network and he's That's like funny. so it, they everyone really really had to scramble so it's just funny quarantine bunch knowing when it was made and we have cameos 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 so give uh yeah give quarantine bunch a shot yeah i'll put it in the description cool for sure yeah, quarantine, uh, is it the, the quarantine bunch .com. So I'll find Facebook, it, yeah. The thing, the website's great. And um, I have a website, keithcooganonline.com. Yeah, we're and, planning um, on putting that on there. There, I do autographs, sell them online. You can also go to Cameo. I do that. But conventions, we've been going and doing it in person. So we got Salt Lake coming up. We're going to do a show down near San Diego, uh, Fandoms Unite. And then we're off to Rhode Island for the big Rhode Island Comic Con where they're doing a Cobra Kai show where it is the first autograph appearance of one Miss Elizabeth Shue. We're oh, also going to wow. have Vincent D'Onofrio and Maya Bruton, Sarah from Adventures of Babysitting. I think we're working on Anthony Rapp. We're trying to get a cast reading together for that. So come mm. to Rhode Island Comic Con towards the end of the year. That is going to be one heck of a show. Yeah, Excellent. I would love to be at that reunion. That'd be great. I know. Oh my goodness! Well, uh, we've taken up about an hour and a half of your time. I've exhausted you. Yeah, <laughs> no, you were great. Your average runtime. Some guests were like thirty minutes. Some were forty-five. A lot of it came in around the hour mark, a little over. I saw it, and I was like, I probably do an hour with these guys. Easy. So thanks for bearing with me. Hey, this was unreal. Verbal diarrhea. Well, we'd love to have you back, actually, sure. because I think I could go another hour and a half. I love your energy. And I know <laughs> there's so many things, you know, we're talking about these platforms and movies are now series is, you know, they're like movies are like 10 hour things now. And then there's uh, multiple series. I mean, I, the, uh, entertainment is changing so much and there seems to be so much more contact. I hope you get yourself out there more because, you know, I re really appreciate all the things you've already done. And just talking to you today. Sure. <laughs> you're just so much fun you have to get back into it you have just to get back the knowledge no. too that's the fun thing i mean you know it, it breaks your heart that question hurts when you are when you're in it when yeah. you're auditioning for ford versus ferrari or bank mm. or babylon that was one of the last ones that mm. broke my heart oh also I, I just auditioned for the world's greatest beer run the, to be zach efron's dad sometimes you're reading for stuff and you know you're not right for it you're like well you know they're they did it for uh, Don't Tell Mom. They had everybody, all of the stoner friends of Kenny, read for Kenny. And then if you don't get Kenny, you get slotted into the friend positions. So it behooves you even if you're not right for the – is that Tom Cruise playing that role? We're just having everyone read this scene 
no matter what, and then we're casting you accordingly. Some casting directors think that actors can morph and change, will do hair and makeup, they'll look like the others. Others really want to cast someone that is so close to the character that there's no acting involved. And I prefer those, but I also like to put on the weird wigs and the makeup and the hair. And it, it depends. I like serious stuff. I like weird comedy. I like, I'll do Downhill Willie and then I'll also, you know, Paramount Pictures Cousins. That's a nice yeah. or look at drama, a romantic to comedy. That oh, was yeah. a real deep one. That was made by Douglas Tarola, directed it, and he put together that drunk, stupid, stoned National Lampoon documentary oh, which yeah, then turned okay. into the feature which then and that is a great freaking documentary him and his two producer buddies they uh made a reason to believe on their dad's american express cards wow they put a hundred grand on each card yeah. it cost three hundred thousand dollars they flew the whole cast out from la put them up local in off-campus housing we lived as students for several weeks while we shot. We were banned and we were not allowed on the campus. We shot in uh, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Yeah, over uh, by where Cincinnati. Little Man far. Tate. It's the town yeah. from Little Man Tate. Oh, I love they that were. Movie. They said you can't shoot here, uh, but uh, they used Cincinnati. They just went to Cincinnati and shot at that university. So, oh yeah. Um, it was contentious. They didn't want them tearing apart the Greek system. Uh, they didn't want to talk about date rape on campus. They didn't want to talk about campus rape. They didn't want to talk about date uh, rape culture. They uh, didn't want the movie produced. Oh wow! So they made a fake script. Jeez. Yeah, they made a fake script. It didn't have the rape scene. It was a different story. It included all the same locations and characters where you want to shoot. That's the script you hand to the town to get a green light to shoot there. But it's an Whatever. important subject matter, and that's one. Yeah, I had uh, Jay you know Underwood what? on, and he said Get the same thing. Apologize later, man. Yeah, it's Jay, important Jay had said the same thing. Jay Underwood was on. I had him on, and he said, it, "Well, it touched on an important, you know, subject." Yeah, we had Kim Walker. Uh, we had um, oh God, what's her name from Kate Nally? Daughter, oh, I on, know who you're talking about. Oh man, it's been a while since. I, by the way, I worked with all three Heather's. But never Veronica. So I've never worked with Winona, although I read for Lucas, for the part of Lucas. Oh, yeah. I uh, worked oh. with Lisa Ann Falk, worked with Shannon Doherty, and I've worked with Kim Walker. <laughs> wow. And Heather had had was a who haven't world you picture. worked with? Seriously. It was a new world picture. And on the video cassette, the trailer was under the boardwalk. And on the under the boardwalk, the trailer was for Heather's. And in Adventures of Babysitting, it the print was locked with Camp I Me Love. So the Camp I Me Love print had Adventures of Babysitting trailer and Adventures of Baby tra trailer had Camp I Me Love trailer baked into the print so it would always show before the movie. Wow. wow. But yeah, we'll do another. We'll, we'll get together another time. We have more to talk about. I yeah, suppose. no, you are great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Keith. As always, we are Mark 2.0. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Keith, subscribe. Look for the Thank Blue you, Moon Keith, logo. Keith. I'm sure, Keith, you love our logo, Mark 2.0. Um, thanks so much, Keith. You are a legend. We're going to promote you like crazy. We'll put the pandemic, uh, the quarantine bunch. We'll put your website. We'll put your IMDb. Keith Coogan, everyone. We are so honored. Yeah, get over to Utah this weekend and uh, Salt Lake, right? The Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City Convention. Yeah. Salt Lake City Comic Convention. Uh, so it's the Superheroes in Training, right? Booth number yep. 271. Get down there and give up, get over to the website. You can get an autograph. You can get a bunch of cool stuff. And uh, Keith, it's been a real pleasure, sir. It you really have has. have led a life like few people, and I'm like jealous to the 10th power. And please come back again <laughs> and keep getting in there. I want to see your familiar face. You know, Forever. You're yeah, so never stop. So We're much. not allowing you to ever stop acting. You got great Seriously. energy, man. You got great energy, and I know it's only a matter of time before someone picks up on that. And you're uh, a familiar, familiar scene on my TV again. So, 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 good luck, and uh, man, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.